okay? You're going to right here like this. You're going to try to make that heel hit right there at the ball like that. And then at that point, you're going to try to pivot the club around that axis into it. See that? So, Mr. Blackmar, <laughs> so over your career, you've had a decent short game. Or you, let's, let's say that you had to have a good short game, or you learned to survive a lot with your short game. Would you, would you say that was correct? I never finished in the top 150 in driving accuracy when, back when you needed to. And I only twice finished in the top 125 in greens regulation in 16 years and so yeah I probably your short game you chipped and got it up and down a lot I wasn't the best there was uh, plenty of other guys better than me but I wasn't I was okay and I wasn't afraid to try a shot okay That's so important. yeah there were some stats that we were going through over your crew which I found interesting which for people this is very important to understand <laughs> Some of the majors you played in and the number of fairways you hit and the scores you shoot, there were, there were multiple majors that you played in where you had like two and three fairways and shot 67, 68, Did 60. Did you ever do that? No, honestly, no. no I, hit, I hit three fairways at Firestone and shot 67. That was a good one. Yeah. Back in the 80s, we were still using persimmon wood, so it was playing long, too. And in 97 at the PGA at Wingfoot, and it was coming off Wingfoot, I hit three fairways on Friday and shot 68. That was pretty good. I shot 67 <laughs> at Cog Hill and hit three fairways. I think there were, this guy sent me this, this all the rounds I had on tour, I had three or fewer fairways I hit. I think there were 22 of them. And I averaged 72.4 or something for these for two this. rounds, hitting three or fewer fairways. And so I thought, that's probably pretty good. <laughs> just to I'm, keep your head on top of your shoulders yeah no i would have not bad i would have seriously i might i would have quit yeah i mean i might have i'm sure there were rounds that i thought I, about it no, <laughs> i'm sure there were rounds when i only hit three or four fairways but uh the one major i played that i played well in uh was the u.s open at shinnecock and there, there again i mean it was uh, the first two days and six holes i'd miss two fairways and three greens Never done that on the easiest course. <laughs> so, okay, so, so let's figure out why you were so much better than me. So, just no, you you're out there. You see these guys. You had a good short game. You know, you're phenomenal with wedges. So, what you know, what's going on now? What are these guys doing? What did you used to do? You know, give me give me an idea of of where you're at or what you see. Well, it's, it's a different game today because agronomically, the golf course is in so much better shape. We used to end up in holes. I mean, it was you missed a green, you got a bad lie a lot of times. Yeah. Okay? Even if it wasn't rough, you got a bad lie. Yeah. And so today, you know, everything's cut like this if it's not rough. And, and when I played, 56 was the most loft you had until about 92 or 3. So half my career was with a 56 or less. And today they're using 62s and 64s, this sort of stuff. Top to bottom, the guys on tour, they pitched the ball better than we did, I think, on tour. And they have learned how to use these, these more lofted clubs. And they do it differently than we did because we had bad lies, balls and holes, 56 degrees. We would use the leading edge a lot. We'd drop the club on it to try to make solid contact. Right. Now, because the grass is different and we have more loft, guys are swinging more around themselves with real long, a real long right arm or rear arm, back arm, if you will, and not a whole lot of wrist hinge. And so they're very shallow on both sides of the ball. They've got a lot of turn, the shoulders turn, and they work the club around and release it almost a lot like the full swing. They've been able to use track man and launch monitors and such to figure out the best way for the club to work to produce the most spin. Right. And so they pitched entirely different than, than the way that I did or most of the guys I played with. Um, a lot of guys still use the bounce back in my era, but it was it was different. The other part that's different is these guys can get a new wedge every day if they want, let alone every week. And we would use the same wedge forever. Yeah. Um, if you got one where you liked the way that the sole worked, it was hard to find, and you liked the shaft, you wouldn't change. I remember hitting Tom Weisskopf's or looking at Tom Weisskopf's wedge uh, in 1985 at Hilton Head, and it had a, a spot worn in the middle of it where there was not a single groove. 
There was not one glue in the sink. <laughs> and he's hitting these, these beautiful little flight and low wedges. And I'm like, how did he do that? You know, so it's, so it's a different game. But with that said, um, as far as my own game, um, to be honest with you, I've, I'm very confused. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to do. I, I, I've developed the yips. Uh, I've had them for about five or six years. And I'm not really, I'm not totally horrible, but I'm pretty horrible. I don't even have a left-handed wedge that I've experimented with. When I was playing on the PGA Tour Champions, I experimented with a left-handed wedge. Um, I won in San Antonio on the PGA Tour Champions with the yips putting and with the wedge. So i um, always trying to find a way to work my way around it. And I think what happened was that when I, when I first started with a 56 and using the leading edge a lot, then I would set up, I would set up hands ahead, face a little open, weight forward, like this, and I'm going to just let the club drop on the ball. It's just going to drop. It's not a stab, um, but there's not a lot of follow through. Your follow through is just right there, like that, with your, your hands right in front of your left hip pocket, right like that. And it's not this. You do that, you come up on it, and you've got a lot of tension. So it's just drop the club on the ball, like that, right there. And um, for me, that's the way I learned. And then in about 91 or two, or something like the 91 or two, the 60 degree wedges came out. And I remember at first I hated it. I couldn't hit it hard enough. And then as time went by, I you know, appreciated the value of more loft and learned how to hit a 60. But what it did is it changed how I chipped a little bit. And I think I, over time, I think that's what contributed to my confusion uh, and, and issues. You know, and I have real issues <laughs> now. I really do. And... Um, so I'm not sure. Are you going to help me? <laughs> well, you talked, well, yeah, we, you talked earlier and, and you hit some shots. You said that earlier and now, he says, when you take the club away, you got into really opening the face and, and working it different. Now you're letting your right hand work a little more down. And well, then, for me, I used to practice. I would take my, even in college, I'd take my shag balls out and I would chip a lot. And the first thing I always did was I, I hit the shot I just showed you, hands ahead like this. And I would hit shots across the green and whatnot where that, trying to get the same spins, change, same trajectory yeah. every single time, but I had no target. And then once I could get the same trajectory and the same spin, see, that's important because the ball's going to run out. And if you get it inside of three feet, even you know, on the PGA Tour, that's, that's almost 100%. You know, it's like 97% or 98%. But if you drop back to 5%, all of a sudden that falls back to 80% makes. Yeah, 5 you know, feet, yeah. Six, 6%, six it's like 75%. Yeah. So the value of being inside of 3 feet versus 5 feet is huge. And if you don't know how the ball is going to react when it lands on the green, how do you expect to get it inside of 3 feet all the time? You know how much it's going to run out. And so you've got to know how much you're going to spin it, and you've got to know the trajectory that you're going to hit it on. So my first thing to practice was always that. And then once I could control that, then I would go at a target. Once I could go at a target, then I would start trying to pick a spot to land it on. Then once I could land it on that spot, and the whole time I'm trying to maintain the same trajectory and the same spin. And if I lost control of that, I went all the way back and started completely over. If I maintained it to hit my spot, then I would start doing things like I'd try to chip it over the fringe, pretending it's water short, and I had to go over the fringe and land it on the green within about three or four inches of the edge. And so I start getting more and more precise with my landing spots. Because when you get on, on the course, as opposed to practicing, you're practicing, you got a whole bunch of balls, you're just hitting, you're not worried about it. You know, on the course, you got one ball, and now you got to be precise. If you're not prepared for that, you're not going to do well. And the last thing that I would do is that I would challenge myself with really terrible lies, tight lies, that kind of end of the grain lies, so that when I went and played, I was ready for everything. I'm trying to simulate you know, what the situations I'll face in the golf course. And um, I watched Tom Watson one time warming up, getting ready to play, and the last thing he did was he chipped 10 balls out of a divot. And I asked him about it, you know, why did you chip 10 balls out of a divot? He said, you know, if I can make solid contact out of a divot, what lie will I have today that I should be afraid of? Yeah. It's pretty good. So the same thing. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, I've, over my years playing, I mean, a lot of the guys that were really good would create situations that you wouldn't see or they were right. extremely difficult. I mean, they practiced their normal, but then they would create these situations, whether it was on a tr behind a tree in a divot, really deep rough, buried lies in the bunker, and they'd hit them a few times. Right. And I think, you know, then, like you say, it's when you see these guys, they've hit it multiple times before. They know how to do it for them. They know what to do. 
and they have a in their mind they know they can pull it off. So it's not yeah. the first time they've tried it. You just don't want to be overwhelmed by the situation. So yeah. You want to be ready. So I developed that was my bread and butter shot, and so I hit probably ninety percent of the chips I hit on tour were like this right here. A little low trajectory, um, spin, ball back. Just like that. See, both those balls hit that in exactly the same place. Yeah. And that's what I that's what I would try to do. Once I had that mastered for any given week, because the grass is different from one course to the next. So you got to figure out how the ball is going to react when it lands in the green. How's the club going to work in the ground or the grass that week? That sort of stuff. Once yeah. you figure that out, now I'm like, okay, I got to have some other shots. I got to have 56 degree wedge. I got to have some other shots. And so what I always did was I was not afraid to experiment. I watched other guys to see what they did. And I would try it to see if I could do it, if it fit me. If it didn't, I didn't use it. If it did, then maybe I tried it or, if, or maybe I modified it. But everything for me went back to, I rarely thought about this. Because I know a lot of guys do. They try to slide this along the ground and different things. But I've never seen the ball on a good shot hit that. Right. The ball usually hits that. It's the face, yeah. So I figured out, what do I need to do to get the face consistently on the ball? How can I do that and hit it solid? What's, how can I set up? How can I grip it? And so now we start experimenting with different things um, to hit different trajectories. So I've got to hit it higher. How am I going to do that? And so I had different ways. I'm thinking about this is the, this right here is the, that's the, the face, that's the palm of my hand, and I'm going to use my palm, my hand, to hit this shot. All right, so I'm not thinking about technique here. Think about using this thing. If I want to hit it higher, fine, I'm going to get the grip right at my fingertips, just to my fingertips, so the face is nice and open, and so I can release it. And I'm going to sit there with it in my fingertips like this, and I'm going to release it, make it yeah. that one. It's nice and high and soft. Yeah. And also, I'm very proud of that because I didn't flinch at the end. I'm very proud yeah. of that. <laughs> no, you that's pretty good. Um, so maybe if we play golf after 8 o'clock at night, inside, I, indoors. Inside, I won't so anyway. <laughs> That's how I approached it. That was my approach to chipping. And the biggest, one of the biggest things, I think, the biggest assets that I had was that when I found a shot that I liked, their technique, I was not afraid to do it on the course in the tournament, regardless of what the situation was or what, uh, if I had to hit a very precise spot, I would try it. You know, you made a comment too about, you said that one thing that really helped you and it helped me because you showed me this before I went to the senior tour school 16 some odd years ago. I mean, you talked about, and you hear these guys talk about hinge and hold. Well, what is actually hinge? I mean, so there's very little up and down. So you, you talked about your right hand, your right hand goes back like this, and then you felt this pressure in the back of your right hand, and you just kept that going, and you kept it swinging around. So, but there was no very little up and down. No, it depends on the shot. So the low shot that I hit exactly, I want to. This right here is directly related to the amount of loft. If I go, if I take this club like this, I've got some hinge here and I've got that amount of loft right there. If I straighten that hinge out and all of a sudden I've got more loft. If I increase that, I've got less loft. One of the worst things that you can do when you try to hit a low shot is have the ball jump up in the air. It's going to come up short every single time. So you're going to make sure it stays down. You hit a little lower than you intend and still hit a good shot. But if you hit higher, it ain't going to work out. And so for me, the low shot was all about maintaining that right there with this. I would pivot my weights on my left leg, and I'm going to pivot on my left leg. Now, I'm not standing flat-footed, but I'm not going to shift my weight. I'm going to pivot on my left leg. I'm going to maintain that. I'm going to take it back this way to even increase it. And I'm going to come, and I'm going to rotate this just a little along with that rotation. Because if I go like that, then it's going to come up. And when you hit any of these shots, you can't have any up and down movement. There's no weight shift. And there's no change in knee flex. If you change really? your knee flex, you have to go home early. They will send you home early on Friday every time. Yes, I've okay, you know that. I've had that I've problem. I've had that issue. <laughs> so you know you want your knees to stay. They work this way. They turn. They don't bounce. No bouncing. And um, and so so the low one, increase increase this to decrease that, and then just turn around that front leg and try it there. Now when you say around your front leg, your where's the so you're standing primarily on your front leg, so you're not moving force right to left. But so let's say as you're coming down into the ball at impact, or as you're coming down, where's the force in your left foot? And at impact and past impact, where does it go? It moves. 
So I'm standing on my left foot like this, and I'm going to turn a little bit. You can feel it when you do that. Just make it, you just feel your weight right now. My weight's over the ball of my foot. I've got a fair amount on the underneath the it's over the arch. There's a fair amount on the ball of my foot right there. And then as I turn, it moves back this way. But I, just hitting this shot, I don't want it to move so much that my foot comes off the ground. Because if it does, I'm going to lose my balance. I'm not going to have control. So it's just, just short shots like this. It's just, it's just doing this right there. That's all it's doing. Just right. Rotating right there. And you're timing that pivot with the club going through the ball. Yeah, I don't want the pivot to go way ahead of it. Because if it does, what I always thought of was this. Was that if you hit the ball, speed, the speed the club moves comes from wrist hinge. It comes from how fast your arms are swinging. Right. It comes from how much turn you have in your upper body. It comes from how much you use your hands. It comes from weight shift. All those things contribute to the speed of the club. And I wanted to try to marry all those to where that I only had one thing, that they all work together. So I took the hit with the hand out, so that stayed like that. I took the wrist hinge. It might hinge a little bit here, but it didn't hinge over here for this low one. Because I wanted, I wanted this to go the same speed as my arms, the same speed as my shoulders, the same time and speed with my hips. Now, if it does that right there, look at everything's doing the exact same speed right. at the same time. If I go early with my pivot like this, then it's see how it's going to and it's going to dump mm -hmm. and it's going to continue Catch. speed. I don't want that. I want it to go together. And a lot of guys today, the chipping today, they'll stick the club right here and they're kind of working this way yeah. to get things working the same speed. So. If you use a lot of wrist hinge, it's hard to do that. Right. So there's not a lot of hinge in it. But, but for that shot, the hinge is not up. The hinge, if there is any, is more flexion. And you know, extension. extension at the end if, if you do release in. Now, set up. You, this was one thing you really, and you got on me again when you got here. Uh, Why you can't remember this? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a typical student. <laughs> so... You told me when we were, I was getting ready to go to the senior tour school, and you caddied for me in a senior event. I don't know if you remember. In Houston. In Houston. Yeah, and we got out there, and I was going along playing pretty good, and then all of a sudden I hit it short of a bunker on a par four, whatever. I had to go over a bunker, and I chunked it. Tight life. So I got over the bunker, but didn't hit it very good. Got another one. Pretty much did the same thing. You didn't say anything. And all of a sudden we get through, and you go, we found a parking piece of grass somewhere. And you go, and you throw a ball down, and you go, you know, it's okay, Mike, to be ahead of the ball, to be in front of it, to be to the left of it. And you can't play with your freaking shoulders aimed at the sky. So when you talk about setup, what, when, what are you talking about there? I mean, what's the mistake most people make, me included? Okay, it, there's a couple things here. Number one, I didn't say anything because the golden rule of caddies keep up, shut up, and put up. Well, you did. You were so I had to be a good caddy. You were. were done. Then I was fired. I'm like, I can't say anything I want. <laughs> the other thing is this. Is, is you, it, the club is your hand. And you're trying to use a club like your hand to hit the ground and the ball at the same time and do what you want. Now, you're going to want the club to work this way. And it's at the bottom. It's an arc. And at the bottom of the arc is the ball. If that arc shifts backwards, then the bottom of the arc is going to happen before the ball, and you're going to hit it fat. If the bottom of the arc is in front of the ball, you're going to hit it thin. So what affects that? Well, if I set up like this with my center right over the ball and a little weight forward, the bottom of my arc is going to be pretty much coming down, and there will be a little flat spot at the bottom of it. And the beginning of that flat spot, if I'm going to hit a low one like this, is going to be right here, just underneath my buttons right here, and it's going to be flat past it. If you're going to hit a high one, you want it to be more at the middle of the flat spot, so you don't lean quite as much ahead. You can just get right here even with it. You're just even. And your arc works very much like your shoulders do. Okay? So if my shoulders are level, then my arc is going to bottom out right here. What happens if I go like this? I don't know. <laughs> you do too. You're going to hit right back here. Why? <laughs> because the, the bottom, you just shifted the bottom of your arc behind the ball. So when you go like this, you're, you're likely going to you're likely going to chunk it. Or you got to have really good hands, where you know that, and you can slip that club up there with your hands to maybe hit some sort of a trick shot. Yeah, that's possible. But you better have some excellent skills if you're going to do that. 
I occasionally got away with that, but not very often. Not often when I saw. No. <laughs> so that's set up. So if you get the setup right and you got the right concept of the clubs, your hand, and what you're trying to do with that, and where you're trying to make the swing bottom out. The other thing I noticed, and I noticed a lot with you guys when I first started playing, and I hadn't noticed it that much until I got out there, but you get little short shots, and you'd sit there and make, you might make six, eight, ten practice swings. And now, tell me if I'm wrong, but when the, I, I don't remember if I asked you, but I, I know I asked... Uh, Trevino I saw doing that. It's funny he even answered my question. And uh, I asked Ray Floyd one time. I said, guy, you make a lot of practice strokes with your short shots. And he says, well, I'm just trying to get a feel for once I'm set up and I swing, I want the club to bottom out and hit the ground exactly the way I want it to. And then I just step into it and copy what I just did. So did you make, I might know you make sometimes, you sit there and make a lot of practice swings with your little short shots. Is that what you're doing? or Particularly depending on the lie, yes. Um, two things. You get a little short when you're trying to make it, number one. So you try and get a feel for landing it where on the green and how it's going to run out to make it. Um, you got one oh, you're three. trying to make them? Yeah, you're trying to make them. <laughs> and the other thing is, yes, you're trying to get a precise spot. And, you know, we may do something later with the mental, the mental stuff, but mentally what you want to do is you want to narrow everything down so you have just one motivation, one goal, so everything simplifies, narrows down. And if, if I can narrow it down to just trying to make the club, which is my hand, trying to make it hit the ground at that precise spot where the ball is every time, and I do that five or six times, concentration is not creating a shot. Concentration is remembering a shot. If you've never hit the shot before, then you probably shouldn't hit it in the tournament because you're not going to remember it very well. <laughs> if you've got to create it, to create something, it takes words and it takes direction. When you listen to all these people talk, you want to play mentally, you want to play subconsciously. Yeah. Subconscious is not words. You know, those are conscious things. So you have to get rid of words. So you want to remember the feel for playing the shot. So what Raymond was talking about, and I did too, is you sit there and practice, boom, 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 hitting that same spot, and you get in there, and now you got a good memory. You just reinforce that memory, and you just copy what you remember. Yeah, I can tell you. I mean, when I used to play pro-amps, whether it was on the tour or regular pro-amps, or I play with amateurs even today, and I go out and watch them, and practice swings in the fairway, and practice swings around the green, they walk up and they make a pra couple of practice swings, and their club might hit this far behind where the ball is. And they don't care. And, they, and then they just step into it, and I go, whoa, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Did you see where a club was hitting the ground? Now, some go, well, yeah. I go, well, okay, so... So what's going to what are you going to do now? Because if you walk into it the same way and you do the same swing, you're going to hit this far behind it. And a lot of them will say, "Well, I don't. I'm not going to hit it there." I said, "Well, that's called the yips." <laughs> and, and then some of them don't even realize that they're, they're doing where it. their clubs hitting the ground. Yeah. So they're, they're they're very unaware of. I think, like you said, they don't have a clear picture. They're not really sure what they're trying to do. And I don't even. So what they practice a lot of times has no relevance. Well, and it, it doesn't matter if you're going to use the leading edge of this club and make a descending blow or if you use the, the bottom of it, the sole of this club, and you're going to, either way, you got to land the club on the ground at the precise spot, no matter which way you're going to hit it. You know, a lot of people will talk about using the bounce gives you a little bit more leeway. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, you hit an inch behind it, you're probably not going to hit a good shot. If you want to use the bounce, you still want to get it in there close to the ball and use it let it slide for just a little bit. If you're counting on it slide for a couple of inches to get to that ball, it, it may not work I out. I know. So it's, good, it's, you know. There's only certain types of grasses and lies where that works. Deep stuff, you can't. You know, grain yeah. going against you, you can. But any sort of a tight lie, fairway type lie, it's not going to work good. Now, for everybody in general, I mean, I, when it comes to short game, I mean, what would you say? I mean, obviously, you spent thousands of hours always we were here chipping up into this chair a minute ago i'm sure that's not the first time you've tried to do that you've probably done it in hotel chip, rooms chip it on the bed not a hotel rooms on a tight carpet line. so if you had somebody who's an average player and they said well i'm going to practice so how would i allocate my time you know would you short game wise would you say 50 50 60 40 or what would be your what? this is this is this question is a is a video all of its own okay. uh, before we can go with this. There's so many different components of practice. Part of it is maybe working on technique. Part of it is trying to master that technique. And then part of it is trying to master those skills in a variety of situations so that you can remember those things so you have training so you go to play the shot 
you just remember what it was to play the shot in that situation. Um, so you can concentrate the right way. If you don't practice the right way to concentrate, you won't concentrate the right way when you play. The other, the other part is, and that same that, that all holds for the short game as well. So in the short game, you want to practice a certain way where you're practicing contact trajectory first, and then you're practicing dialing it in more and more. Um, you hit approximately 50% of your shots are going to be either with a putter or a wedge, or maybe more, maybe 55, 60% depending on how far you hit it. So if you're going to allocate time, um, you probably should spend about half your time on putting and chipping in that aspect of it and wedges. And, you know, the driver right in today's game, the driver is arguably uh, maybe the most important club, distance, catching a saw, getting it down there. The USJ Distance Report said, said um, distance defines an elite player at this time. Um, so depending on how, how good you are, if you can't get it down there some distance and then play, you, I don't care how good you chip and putt, you're going to struggle. Um, so the driver is very important. But then after that, the wedge, and I see a lot of young players even on the Corn Ferry Tour and the PGA Tour that are not as good with the wedge as they should be. It costs some strokes. This, this club is not that hard to hit. You spend some time with it. And so the wedge and the putter are the next two. And I spend more with the wedge than a putter, but spend some with a putter as well. So at least 50 to 60% with short game, you know, bunkers, wedges, putting, the whole thing. You know, I, I played my first major, first major at Pebble Beach in 82. In my very first practice round in a major, I just was up on the tee and, and uh, getting in my bag to get something out. And I'm, I got my back to the, to the clubhouse at Pebble Beach. And all of a sudden I hear a click, click, click. I hear spikes coming up the stairs and I'm thinking, dang, gosh, dang. And I want to just play by myself. It was late afternoon on Sunday. And I look up and I look at my caddy and he's looking over my shoulder and his eyes are like this. And I, so I turn around and I look and it's Watson. <laughs> and then he gets, so I walk over to him and he goes, he hi. Pretty good name too, didn't yeah, he? I think he finished like first. Yeah. And he, yeah. so he comes over to me, he says, hi, I'm Tom Watson. Do you mind if I play with you? And I'm going, uh, okay. So not from this little practice round I was going to have that was going to be nice and calm. Now all of a sudden, all these people come up to the first tee because, well, they're not there to watch me, but here's Watson. Now, what was interesting is during the round, first hole, he hits it down the fairway. He hits a shot up on the green. And then his caddy, uh, Edwards, picks the ball up, puts one of those discs down at different places, throws him three or four balls over here, and he chips them there, and he throws him three or four balls, he chips them here, moves the pin. We go to the second hole. Hits his drive in the rough, takes his drive out of the rough, puts it in the fairway, hits it up by the green. They get up to the green, takes the same, does the same thing. And we're on the fourth hole, we're walking up the fairway. And he hasn't hit a putt yet. And I go, okay, so can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah, sure. I said, so you haven't hit a putt yet. So every hole you've hit six, eight, 10, 12 chips. He goes, well, Mike, he says, a putt's just a straight line. He said, the only shots that I can't duplicate on the range are the shots around the greens that I'm going to have out here at certain pins. So I'm going to spend a lot of time figuring out if a pin's in a place and I miss the green, what's the club, what's the shot. So when the tournament's on, I'm in pretty good chance. Now, the, the shot on 17 that he holed out on Sunday, the day I played with him, I think he probably hit six or eight or ten balls from that same general area to that same general pin, and that was on Sunday. So I guarantee you by the time he played all those practice rounds, now he said, it, everybody says it was an impossible shot, it was really hard, but he had a good idea what he was doing. That changed my whole perception of how to play practice rounds. Because his philosophy was, I can find a strap, I mean every putt on this golf course is straight, and there's a nice putting green out by the clubhouse. So a putting green is a putting green, but I can't copy these lies that I'm going to get out here on the putting green or in, in on the range or even in the practice facility they have. So he spent a lot of time chipping. That's, that's exactly the way most guys play their practice rounds. That's precisely how I played my practice rounds. And I would hit a few putts and long putts just if there were some tricky long putts to get a feel for the speed. But I would never practice my 10-footers and 3-footers, that sort of thing there. I'd do that on the, on the practice putting green, unless the practice putting green was not any good or not sim similar to the greens on the course. Yeah. And absolutely, you're trying to get a feel for around the greens and save those shots. Um, I did have a chipping contest with Watson one time, with Tom, <laughs> um, at Augusta, the Masters. Oh, wow. Yeah, 98. And it was interesting, and it 
we went, went along doing some stuff, and, and then I picked a shot over a bunker, and I hit first, trying to spin it. It was a little tight lie over a bunker. It's a hole cut real close to the edge of the green, short-sided, and, and he got up and hit this shot where I could tell he wasn't trying to spin it. And I, I asked him, I said, well, why did you not try to spin that shot? He said, I never spent my chip shots or pitches any of it. I never do. Because if I try to spin it, I'm not sure how much spin I'm going to get. So I don't know how it's going to react when it hits the green. Same thing we talked about earlier. I want it to come down like I dropped it out of my hand. And then I know how it's going to bounce and roll. And that way I can, I can predict what it's going to do. Well, Phil, Mike? short game. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the help. Thanks for reminding me that I'm I'm still a normal student and I still don't I still don't learn. Just don't be afraid to experiment. It's, it's a short game. You can experiment. It's all right. Find out what works for you. There's a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think that's and and I, we're seeing more and more of that in golf. Is there's a lot of ways to do it. There's a lot of ways to swing. There's a lot of ways to do a lot of things. Yeah. And um, I think that most of it is whatever you're the most comfortable with. Because uh, I've tried to hit shots I wasn't comfortable with, and usually. Usually, so occasionally they pull off, but the more times than not, they not they don't. Yeah, you got to find the ones you're most likely to succeed with. And if it doesn't, if you don't have a shot for a certain situation, then you just need to play away from trouble and try to get it on the green and two putt and move on. Perfect. Be sure to subscribe to my channel for regular updates and tips. Thanks for watching.